Hello, so we continue our Through the Bible in 10 plus years uh, with this little side uh, venture into uh, an AI living paraphrase. Um, what I've been doing uh, is I have been asking ChatGPT to generate a paraphrase of a chapter, and then uh, I kind of work it a bit. It doesn't come out the way I want it to often. And then I, you know, so I have my AI living paraphrase with a cooperative, cooperative venture. Uh, and then I've been putting the ESV underneath because the ESV is a fairly wooden translation. It, it does have some bias, um, but obviously my translation has some bias too. So it's kind of like an opposite bias. Uh, so uh, without any further ado, we want to finish our Romans 9 through 11 trilogy with Romans 11, surprisingly, or not. Romans 11 is where we find out that even though God has predetermined the plan for uh, most Jews to reject and then uh, Gentiles come in, and then we're going to find here that the Jews come in at the end. So predestination for Paul in, in this case, um, uh, first of all, it's, it's group predestination. There are, of course, Jews that have believed, um, and there are uh, Gentiles who haven't believed. So it's not a a blanket kind of predestination. It's more like the classroom is pre predestined, not the not all the students in the classroom. And the second thing we find out is that uh, being in one or, or another of these groups is not necessarily permanent. So it's not a fixed predestination, even at that. Um, all of this undermines the classic John Calvin interpretation of nine through eleven, as we will as we will see, and um, I'm going to give you a theological uh, interpretation. Um, so this is not a wooden translation. This is a a theologically biased translation. Um, so let's go ahead and dig in, shall we? So here, let's start with the ESV. Um, I ask then, Paul says, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite. I'm a descendant of Abraham. I'm a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. This foreknowledge language reminds us of what he said in Romans 8 and Romans 9. Um, and again, what is he talking about? He's talking about uh, collectively uh, the people of Israel um, and the plan, um, not so much as, Ken Shank, come on down. That's not the way it seems to be working here. We are individualists. We are not everybody necessarily, but most of those who would watch this video are Western individualists. We're wearing individualist glass, glasses. And so it's only natural for us to assume he's talking about individuals. But he's not really talking about individuals here. He's talking about Israel and the Gentiles. And that has to be kept in mind when you're reading through this whole section or you go uh, beyond what Paul said, as Augustine did, as Wycliffe did, as John Calvin did. Uh, and, and as the Reformed tradition has tended to do, and see this about individuals. Um, uh, Christopher Stendhal called Augustine the first modern man, and what he meant was uh, his individualistic focus uh, and reading of Paul. Paul, of course, comes from a group culture, a collectivist culture, um, and so he was not wearing individualist glasses in the way uh, that we are. So here's here's my ChatGPT one two Ken punch. Um, so has God thrown away his people? The physical descendants of Israel? Absolutely not. I'm an Israelite myself. Still, I am still from Abraham's family. I am still from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people, especially those in ethnic Israel, whom he knew ahead of time would believe in Jesus. And I've done a little tweak here with the foreknowledge um, uh, to uh, to indicate you know, that, that there is a true remnant of Israel at this time, as he said in chapter, chapter 9. So let's go on to verse, uh, the rest of verse 2 and verse 3. Here's the ESV. Do you not know what Scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Verse 3, Lord, they killed your prophets. They've demolished your altars. I alone am left, and they're seeking my life. Um, and what is, uh, so here's my uh, AI-assisted paraphrase. Remember what the Scriptures say about Elijah in 1 Kings 19.10? Remember when Elijah complained to God about the people of Israel in the Old Testament? Verse 3, Elijah said, Lord, they've killed your prophets and destroyed your altars. I'm the only one left. Now they're trying to kill me. Okay, I don't think I've changed any meaning uh, so far in these 
uh, in these paraphrases. You might say that when I when I tweak the whom he foreknew, his people whom he foreknew, you might you might argue that I've. I mean, we can debate that, right? Theologically, did I interpret it correctly theologically, or did I not? Um, but anyway, let's move on. Verse four. <clears throat> ESV first. But what is God's reply to Elijah? Quote, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. End quote. Verse 5. So too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. Verse 6. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Now, the ESV, I would say, has a Calvinist bias. And, of course, this sounds very Calvinist, doesn't it? Verse 4. Here's my paraphrase. Uh, but what was God's answer to Elijah? God said, you don't see the full picture, Elijah. I still have preserved well over 7,000 people who have not worshipped the false god Baal. Verse 5, it's the same now. There is a small group that God has chosen because of his kindness. And if it is by, verse 6, and if it is by God's grace, his unearned favor, then it is not based on what someone has done. If it were, then kindness wouldn't be kindness anymore. It would be deserved. Um, okay, so I I don't think I've, uh, I've, I've, changed much in that. Basically, God says, you're not seeing the whole picture. I mean, I think that's implied. Uh, Elijah, um, you know, there is a, ch a group that God has chosen uh, because of his grace. Um, and okay, so that does sound, that does ver sound very Calvinist, doesn't it? Um, but uh, I don't, I just don't think Paul had worked out these things philosophically in the way that Augustine would or Wycliffe would or Calvin would. Um, for uh, Paul uses uh, predestination language, again, primarily oriented around groups, and you can change, um, whereas uh, he also uses this sense of whoever wants to come may come. And Paul doesn't work out the philosophical details between these two. He, he lets them hang there. I mean, the problem uh, with Augustine, I would say, and Calvin, is that they, they filled in the blanks, um, and it led to, you know, a picture of God where God basically is responsible for evil, uh, fully responsible for evil in the Calvinist system, uh, I would say. Um, well, anyway, um, we keep going. Verse 7. So what does this mean? Oh, I'm sorry, let's read the ESV first. Verse 7. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking, but the elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. The elect among, among Israel. Uh, let me pause for a second here. Okay, I changed this a, a little bit. Um, um, again, I'm I'm taking this sense of God's permissive will uh, as what is implied here rather than his completely uh, dictated will, that is to say. So uh, here's how I've ended up doing it just now. Verse 7, so what does this mean? Israel did not get what it was looking for. A select group in Israel were found to be acceptable to God because of their faith, but the hearts of most in Israel are hardened, refusing to believe. Okay, so taking it uh, as the elect as being, well, who's here? You're the elect. Um, you're here, so you're the elect. Um, you're the chosen ones. You're a select group. Um, the question is whether God uh, directed their 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 faith, or whether God uh, provided a framework uh, that in, in enacted their faith of their choice. Verse verse eight from the ESV. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. So here's my theological interpretation. This situation matches what the Spirit says through Deuteronomy 29.4 and Isaiah 29.10. God let them continue in their spiritual sleep. He left them with eyes that do not see and ears that do not hear. This state has continued to this day. Paul kind of splices together uh, two different verses here. The first part uh, uh, has more to do with, I think, uh, Isaiah 29, I think it is. And the last part more from, from Deuteronomy. So he, he kind of splices the two verses uh, together in a kind of spiritual interpretation. Um, and again, I've, I've gone with permissive will language here um, rather than directive will language here, um, theologically interpreting uh, what, what the theology uh, behind it is. Verse 9, um, and David says... Uh, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and bend their backs forever. Um, verse, here's my theological reading, paraphrase. David also says in Psalm 69, 22 and 23, let their own table become a trap and a net for them. Let them be punished by stumbling over their own plans. Verse 10, let their eyes stay darkened so they cannot see. May their backs be bent in shame forever. A little ambiguity as to what bend their backs forever 
what, what does that exactly mean? It's not entirely clear. Paul seems here to be tra tra uh, quoting the Septuagint, by the way, rather than the Hebrew. Um, and I assume that the reason why he quotes the Septuagint, and I think that's true of some other um, quotes in this chapter, uh, the Septuagint being the Greek translation of the Old Testament, is because that would have been the translation of the Old Testament uh, that uh, the church in Rome used in their worship. And so uh, Paul was not concerned. I mean, he knows Hebrew, right? Um, so he can he knows what the Hebrew, the way this reads in Hebrew. But he he chooses to speak to to uh, present the inspired message to them through the translation that they actually use in Rome, um, which is the Greek uh, translation. Even though it's different, it'd be like it'd be like me preaching from the ESV if I preaching to a congregation that uses the ESV or me using the NIV with an NIV co congregation or the King James with the King James translation, even though the wording of the Bible might be a little different uh, in those different versions, um, God's meeting them where they're at. And Paul does this here. He uses a, a quote from uh, the Psalm that is worded this way in the Greek, but it not exactly worded this way um, in the original uh, Hebrew. Uh, there's uh, Im implications there for the use of scripture and theology of scripture, I think, um, hiding in, in there. Um, now, again, uh, uh, the, the, the theological assumption I'm making uh, in this paraphrase is that God, God starts with where people's choice lies. That is to say, he hardens people whose choice is already against him. Um, and so uh, I paraphrase it in that way, um, let their eyes stay darkened. They had a, a, a part in their eyes being darkened. But once their eyes were darkened, God, God went with it as, it, as it were. He let their eyes stay darkened. Um, so again, we can debate that paraphrase, but it is, I'm making a Western Armenian paraphrase, right? I'm not making a Calvinist paraphrase. Uh, verse 11, here's the ESV. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Verse 12. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their for full inclusion mean? So here's my paraphrase. Verse 11. So did they fall down so badly that they can never get up again? Absolutely not. And again, here's my, here's my sense again that the Augustinian and, and uh, Calvinist interpretation of this passage, it doesn't work because Israel can change. Uh, first of all, it's group-oriented, but also they can change where they're, and they will. He, he's going to go on to say that Israel will change their, their status. And so this predestination here is not, uh, it's not a fixed kind of thing. It's a flexible thing uh, that, as we will see as we go through this chapter, involves the, the will of the humans that, that are involved. Uh, through their, let's continue, through their sinfulness, salvation has come to the Gentiles. It will make those who have not believed in Israel become envious at what God is doing for the Gentiles. I'll make it clear there. Verse 12, their sin, Israel's sin, Israel's sin brought riches to the rest of the world, 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 <laughs> one world. Uh, Israel's sin brought riches to the rest of the world, and their loss made the Gentiles spiritually wealthy. How much more wonderful will it be when all the Jews believe? And I do think that's what Paul is saying here. Um, at the moment, uh, Israel's hardened and the Gentiles are believing, but the Gentiles are going to become jealous of what God is doing through the Jews. I'm sorry, the Jews will get jealous of what God is doing through the Gentiles, and they will uh, return to their Lord. Um, verse 13. Uh, I'm now speaking to you Gentiles in as much as I... Uh, am an apostle to the Gentiles. I, uh, inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry, verse 14, in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. Verse 15, for if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life uh, from the dead? And I do think that the audience of Romans is primarily Gentile. Um, that, it's not like he's saying, okay, don't listen to me, the rest of you in the congregation, while I talk to the Gentiles. Um, the, the congregation at Rome that he's writing to is enough predominantly Gentiles, that he can pretty much address the whole church as Gentiles. Not, not that all of them were G Gentiles, but many of them, most of them were, I think. Verse 13, I'm talking to you Gentiles because I'm apostle 
to non-Jews. I'm God's apostle to non-Jews. I'm very honored to do this work. Verse 14, I'm hoping that I can make my own people jealous and that at least some of them will be saved as a result. Verse 15, if their rejection of Jesus brought reconciliation to the rest of the world, how magnificent will their faith in Jesus be? It will be like resurrection from the dead. Okay, let's do uh, verse 16 uh, through 18 here. First, first, the ESV. If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Verse 17. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although you're a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, verse 18, do not get ang arrogant toward the branches. If you, if you are, you remember, it's not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. It's an Israel tree. It's not, uh, it's a, and it's not even a neutral tree. It's an Israel tree. Um, the, the root is Israel. And some of those natural branches in Israel today have been cut out. Um, and he basically says, don't get cocky. Oh, actually, let's see my paraphrase here, AI in my paraphrase. Verse 16, if the first piece of dough is holy, Israel, then the whole batch is holy, the world. If the root is holy, Israel, so will the branches be, the world. Verse 17, so some branches were broken off in Israel. Let's say in Israel. Shall we say that? You Gentiles, a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others in Israel who believed. You're now sharing in the nourishing sap from the olive root of, let's go ahead and put, of Israel. Verse 18, the bottom line is, don't be proud over the fact that you're in the tree and that many of the original branches aren't currently. If you get cocky, remember, you do not support the root. The root of Israel supports you. I, again, okay, let me clean it up a little bit. Okay, I cleaned it up. Pause, pause it if you want to read how I cleaned it up. It's the same thing, basically, just worded a little differently. Let's go on then to, to 19. Let's see, does this go up? No, it doesn't. Okay, uh, you will, okay, let's read the ESV of verse 19 through 21. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Verse 20, that's true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. Verse 21, for if God did not spare the natural branches, neither, neither will he spare you. In other words, uh, just because you have been grafted into the tree doesn't mean it's a, it's a definite. Um, God can still graft you out if you don't have faith, and God can graft that back them back in if they do have faith. So you can see pre predestination doesn't mean, you keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Uh, it doesn't mean what Calvin and Augustine thought it did because you can switch, and it's a matter of faith. Again, Paul doesn't explain how all this fits together. Um, Calvinists go one way with the explanation. I've gone uh, in another direction with the theological interpretation. Paul just gives you the raw situation. Verse 19. Here's the, the AI paraphrase. You will say then, but branches were broken off so I could be grafted in. Verse 20. True. But why were they broken off? They were broken off because most of Israel didn't believe, while you currently have faith. Don't be arrogant, but tremble at the significance of what we're talking about here. Verse 21. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either if you do not continue in faith. Okay, let's look now at uh, 22 through uh, 24, ESV first, 22. Note then the kindness and the severity of God, severity toward those who've fallen, but God's kindness to you provided you continue in his kindness. Again, there's no eternal security here. You have to continue in his grace in order to make it. Otherwise, you too will be cut off, verse 23. And even if they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in for God has the power to graft them in again. Again, see how as we get to the end of this chapter, it's all about your your choice of faith. It's not predetermined uh, in the language he has here. Um, uh, uh, verse 24, for if you are cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? Now for my paraphrase, verse 22. Notice how God is both kind and severe. He is severe towards those who fall away, but kind to you if you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. Verse 23. And if the unbelieving in Israel do not continue in unbelief, they will be grafted back in, for God is able to graft them in again. No one's final state is already decided. A little paraphrase there. Verse 24. You were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree, the Gentiles. Um, is a wild tree. 
Contrary to your default situation, you are grafted into a cultivated olive tree, true Israel. So how much more will these natural branches of ethnic Israel be grafted back into their own olive tree? Okay. Uh, now we get to, to some highly debated verses. Uh, uh, there are those who kind of take a replacement you know, the, the Israel doesn't, ethnic Israel means nothing anymore. It's entirely uh, the church is Israel. Um, then you've got a kind of a dispensationalist who say, well, Israel's salvation is something different from Christian salvation, or you, you know, some who might go that far. I think there are some that might. Um, I'm, I think I have Paul understood here. We'll, we'll see what you think. Verse 25, lest you be wise in your own sight. I do, and he's talking to Gentiles. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers and sisters. A partial hardening has come upon Israel. That is, some of Israel doesn't believe right now. Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and in this way all Israel will be saved. Now, see, in this way is a is a bias of uh, the ESV translators, I would say, um, because the word is basically thus, and thus all Israel will be saved. I, I think it has to be saying that part is hardened, and then all Israel will be saved. Um, and so, and then, actually then would be an even better. And then all Israel will be saved. Now part is hardened, but then all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. What's, what's the Messiah doing here? The Messiah is turning away those who are rebels at the moment. The hardened are being saved. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. God's going to forgive those who... So he, what he's not talking about, he's talking about ethnic Israel that doesn't believe right now. They're currently hardened. They're, they're hardened in part, but they will, they will believe. They will come. They, they will, ungodliness will be banished. Their sins will be taken away. And then in the future, when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, all Israel will be saved. That's what I think he's saying here. So here's my AI assisted paraphrase. Verse 25. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery so that you won't get conceited. A part of ethnic Israel has experienced a hardening at this moment, but this situation is temporary until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. Verse 26, at that point, the rest of Israel, all Israel, will be saved. As it is written in Isaiah 59, 20 through 21, the deliverer, Christ, will come from Zion. He will drive away the current godlessness from Jacob, from Israel, verse 27, and this new covenant through Jesus will be my covenant with them, when I take away their sins, I think I think I've got the the meaning of Paul here right. Uh, maybe verse twenty seven. I I don't feel as confident about twenty seven, but the rest of it I I, I feel pretty clear. Uh, and as we keep going, it just continues to confirm um, what I'm saying here. Uh, so let's go ahead and read the ESV of twenty eight twenty nine. Verse twenty eight is as regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as regards election. They are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. In other words, they are still God's people, the people, the group, even though currently they're not believing. Um, and, and at the moment, they're enemies to those of you who believe. Here's the paraphrase, verse 28. At this time, because they are enemies of the good news of Jesus, Israel's like your enemy. But Israel is still God's chosen people. God still loves them because of his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs. Verse 29, the bottom line is that God's gifts and his calling of Israel is irrevocable. He has not abandoned them. Okay, so now we get, uh, again, it continues. Again, this train of thought is just every every verse we go to, the same conclusion that the hardened are going to be saved. It just boom, 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 over and over again. Verse 30. Uh, ESV. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God and now have received mercy because of their disobedience, verse 31, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they may now receive mercy. For Verse 32. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. So again, he's not talking about true Israel, which is the redefined church. No, he's saying that those who are currently disobedient will eventually receive mercy because they will believe. Um, and so, again, I, I realize that this is not a uh, popular interpretation. Some circles and, and, and dispensationalists probably take it uh, to realms they shouldn't take it to, perhaps. But it does seem to be saying that, uh, Paul seems to be saying that his, peop his ethnic people, Israel, will come to Christ when Jesus uh, returns. And of course, he probably thought it was within his lifetime. So it's been a little, little while, but 
That seems to be what he's saying. Verse 30, let's read the paraphrase. Once you were disobedient to God, but you have now received the opportunity for mercy as a result of their disobedience. Verse 31, so now they too have become disobedient and will also receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. Verse 32, God has allowed everyone to be disobedient to him with the result that he can have mercy on everyone uh, as well. Again, I did a little theological interpretation here with the God has allowed. Um, um, he has agreed, he's allowed it, he's consigned it. Um, now, um, I do want to mention Aristotle's fourth cause. Uh, so Aristotle talked about four different kinds of causes. There's the kinds of causes that we we think about cause effect in terms of the the direct cause, the efficient cause. You know, you know the the fist hit my face and I went flying. That's a efficient cause. There's also the the kind of t, uh, um, uh, the uh, the purpose claw cause. You know, kind of like why did he do that? He did that because he was angry with me because of something I said. You know, there was the reason behind it, the for formal cause. That's what it is the formal cause. Aristotle had two causes that we would not think of causes. And the reason I'm saying this is because um, it might be worth keeping in mind that the way that that Paul thought about cause and effect might have included things that we wouldn't include. Um, the, the, the first cause that Aristotle had was the material cause. We don't think of that a cause as a cause at all. There's, there's just the stuff. The stuff is kind of like, it's, it's, it's just there. It's, putty in the hands of other forces. We don't we don't think of the material itself as a cause, but uh, and I'm not saying that that has anything to do with the New Testament, but uh, for the sake of completion, I'm talking about Paul's four causes. The fourth cause, and this is the one I'm I started this tangent on, is the telic cause or the per or the final cause. And again, we do not think of uh, of this as a cause. We think of it as a result. So, why did it rain? Well, so that the earth could be watered. We don't think that way at all. No, uh, yes, the the earth being watered is a result of it raining, but it's not the cause of it raining. Um, uh, but they could talk about the result as a cause, and the reason I'm bringing that up is because sometimes, um, if if that if Paul is thinking it all that way, then it justifies my theological translation, because it's not uh, because when you talk about you know this happens so that. You know, they they were consigned to disobedience so that uh, you might have obedience. I'm, there's at least the possibility that Paul is not thinking about that in the kind of cause-effect way that we think about it, but more in a sense of that's the situation, that's the result, that's the way it is, that's what happened. Um, and so, we, you know, if he, if he at all has any Arist Aristotelian thinking, then that result thinking... Um, and you can see where then Augustine or others who might not have that thinking would misinterpret what Paul is saying uh, because he's using that language. Well, uh, that's uh, something to be considered, at least uh, in some other context, perhaps. Well, let's go ahead and read the final section here of this chapter, which is a great doxology that ends the first 11 chapters of Romans. First, the ESV. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable, inscrutable his ways! Verse 34, For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him, that he might be repaid? Verse 36, For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Okay, so here's my paraphrase. Uh, oh, don't change much here. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. Who could possibly trace what he is doing in the world? Verse 34, as Isaiah 40, 13 says, who knows what the Lord is thinking? Who could he possibly need as a counselor? Verse 35, who has ever lent something to God such that he would need to repay them? Let me stick an ever in here. Verse 36, for from him and through him, I need capital H's in this translation, uh, and for him are all things to him uh, be glory forever. Interesting, uh, chat GBT usually capitalizes all pronouns for God, but it didn't in this case for some reason. Well, there you have it. Uh, I'm not saying I'm right, uh, but we have danced with the text of Romans 11 in a AI started paraphrase and a theologically finished paraphrase a la Ken. And uh, there you have it. Feel free to tell me what you think in the comments. And hopefully we'll see you next week 
uh, probably with uh, Romans 1, since we've been going backwards. I do have a cor Romans course on Udemy. Uh, nobody, uh, well, there have four people who've signed up for it. Um, uh, if you if you do sign up for that, be sure and give me a five-star review because I, I don't think they promote it if it doesn't have any reviews and nobody's reviewed the course yet. So anyway, this has been Ken Shank.